Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of the sea wind murders? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case. I'll move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. Malcolm Graham III was from Connecticut. He attended college in Michigan. He was employed by General Motors in the 1950s. When Malcolm was 28 years old, his uncle died and left him $100,000 in stocks and bonds. This dramatically changed his life. It afforded him new freedom. In the late 1950s, he moved to San Diego, California, and met a woman named Eleanor Laverne Graham. In 1961, the couple married in Mexico. They spent a lot of time sailing on their 37 and a half foot catch named Sea Wind. A catch is a two-masted sailboat. In the 1970s, Malcolm started a business where he built boats and remodeled them. He ran this with a friend. Malcolm was able to work remotely. In June of 1974, when Malcolm was 43 and Eleanor was 41, they decided to go on one last extended sailing voyage before settling down. This would be their last adventure of this type. Their sailing and vacation plans included spending about one or two years at the Palmyra Atoll. This is also referred to as Palmyra Island. It is one of the northern line islands in the Pacific. It is south of Hawaii, about one-third of the way from Hawaii to American Samoa. During World War II, there was a U.S. naval base on the island, but by this time it had been closed for many years. The island was uninhabited. The couple first sailed to Hawaii before starting the just over 1,000-mile journey to the Palmyra Atoll. Sea Wind was well equipped for the journey. The couple had spent two years preparing for the trip. They had plenty of supplies. The vessel was equipped with the latest technology and had a workshop equipped with an acetylene torch and a lathe. The couple kept the vessel in perfect working order. It was described as luxurious and well-maintained. As an additional safety measure, the couple had regular radio check-ins with a man named Kurt Shoemaker, who lived in Hawaii. When the Grahams first arrived on the island on July 1, they were disappointed to discover that they were not the only ones who had the idea of visiting the island. They encountered a few people there, Less than a week before the Grahams arrived, a man named Buck Dwayne Walker and his girlfriend, Stephanie K. Stearns, had arrived in their 30-foot sloop named Iola. Buck had an extensive criminal history. He had been convicted of armed robbery and passport fraud. In addition, both he and Stephanie had recently faced drug charges related to selling ecstasy. Buck pleaded guilty to the charges, and the charges against Stephanie were dropped. Buck was free on bail when the couple set sail for the Palmyra Atoll. Their plan was to grow marijuana on the island, which they could sell, and use that money to survive. Buck had no intention of going to prison. Their vessel was in bad shape. The hull was cracked, and it was taking on water. The ship's auxiliary engine was not functional. The couple did not have good navigation skills. It took them three weeks to make a trip that should have only taken about ten days. It was clear that they were not prepared for such a long voyage or for life on the island. After arriving, it was clear to everybody on the island that Iola was not seaworthy. Other sailors actually had to help Iola into the harbor. It couldn't even sail 172 miles to Fanning Island, which was the closest place to purchase supplies. This put Buck and Stephanie in a bad position. Essentially, they were stranded. They started selling their possessions to other visitors for food. The Grahams did not like Buck and Stephanie. They knew the couple as Roy and Stephanie because Buck was using an alias. Buck Walker was unsophisticated and rude. Stephanie had more social skills. So she got along okay with everybody, but Buck was just intolerable. The Grahams considered them to be hippies, which was much different than how they looked at themselves. When offered a cigarette by Malcolm, Buck took half the pack. One of Buck's dogs, a pit bull, 
attacked Eleanor in July. Buck did not respect the local habitat. For example, he would cut down coconut trees with a chainsaw and fish by shooting his 22 caliber pistol into the water. Buck's plan of growing marijuana was not working out. The insect life on the island ate the seeds before anything could grow. The couple was getting tired of eating only coconuts and fish. Their prospects for the future did not look bright. A few other people who visited the island around that same time advised the Grahams to be careful regarding Buck and Stephanie. Malcolm said he wasn't worried because he had a 357 Magnum revolver. As the weeks went by, other visitors to the island left, in part because Buck and Stephanie were there. These departing visitors reported that tension was high between the Grahams and Buck and Stephanie. By August 17, only two vessels were left on the island, Sea Wind and Iola. Eleanor repeatedly asked Malcolm if they could leave the area, but he did not want to give in. Kurt Shoemaker last heard from the Grahams on August 28, 1974. This was their final radio check-in, although it was not supposed to be. During this communication, Malcolm told Kurt that he saw a dinghy sailing over to Sea Wind. He said, I guess they've made a truce, referring to Buck and Stephanie. Malcolm also mentioned seeing a cake. A woman's voice can be heard, and then laughter. The last thing Malcolm said was, I better find out what's happening. Nobody had seen the couple or heard from them after this. The Grams were missing. Malcolm missed the next scheduled check-in, something he never did. He was very good about making sure he had contact with Kurt Shoemaker. In September of 1974, friends of the Grams became very concerned about what happened to them. They arranged for a plane to fly over the island. The pilot did not see any vessels there at all. It was completely deserted. In October, Sea Wind sailed into a harbor in Honolulu. Buck and Stephanie were operating the vessel. The boat had been partially repainted and renamed, but it was clear that it was Sea Wind. Buck and Stephanie were eventually arrested. Buck was able to escape initially. He was captured later. Stephanie fled as well, but she was captured immediately. The couple was charged with stealing Sea Wind, but not with murder. They told investigators that Malcolm and Eleanor invited them onto Sea Wind for dinner, but when they arrived, no one was there. They went looking for the Grams the next day and found an overturned dinghy on the beach in the lagoon. The dinghy belonged to the Sea Wind. The couple only decided to take the Sea Wind in order to protect it from vandals. They used Sea Wind to tow Iola, but Iola sank on the reef just inside the harbor. Buck and Stephanie were both convicted of stealing Sea Wind and other related charges. Buck Walker was sentenced to 10 years in prison. This was to run concurrently with a five-year sentence for selling ecstasy. This, of course, occurred before the incident with Sea Wind. Stephanie was sentenced to two years. She was released to a halfway house after seven months. In January of 1981, a South African couple who was visiting the Palmyra Atoll found a human skull and other bones. The remains had fallen out of an aluminum box that washed up on the beach after a storm. The couple had read about the case of Malcolm and Eleanor Graham and contacted the authorities. The remains were identified as belonging to Eleanor Graham. Malcolm's remains were never found, but he is presumed dead. Eleanor's skull had a hole in it consistent with being shot at point-blank range. Her bones had been exposed to high temperatures. Perhaps something like an acetylene torch was involved, like the one that Malcolm had on board, Sea Wind. Buck Walker and Stephanie Stearns were arrested in 1981 and charged with murder. Buck had actually escaped from prison before that, so when the FBI went to get him, he wasn't there. The authorities found him in Arizona and arrested him. The couple was tried separately, Buck in 1985 and Stephanie in 1986. Buck Walker was convicted and sentenced to life in prison. He was released in 2007 and died in 2010 of a stroke at the age of 72. Stephanie Stearns was able to convince a jury that Buck had acted alone. Her attorney was a prosecutor who convicted Charles Manson and put up an incredibly 
effective defense. Stephanie Stearns was acquitted of all charges. Now moving to my analysis. Buck Walker did not testify at his trial. He would later say that the Grams died because of a love triangle gone bad. He claimed that he was having sex with Eleanor when Malcolm caught them. Malcolm shot and killed Eleanor and tried to shoot him, but of course he was able to escape. As I mentioned, Stephanie testified at her trial. She denied knowing anything about the murder. Many people, of course, believe that both Buck and Stephanie were guilty, even though Stephanie was acquitted. Let's take a look at the evidence both for and against the idea that they were guilty, starting with the inculpatory evidence. Stephanie was with Buck willingly. She knew that he was on bail. They acted as a team when they were on the island and were illegally trying to grow marijuana. The couple was in a desperate situation. They did not have an operational boat and had exhausted their supplies. If they called for help, Buck would have been sent to prison. Witnesses said that the Grams were not getting along with the couple. There was tension on the island. The story that the couple provided to the authorities does not make sense. If they really took the sea wind because they wanted to protect it, why did they repaint it and rename it? Were they trying to put it in the boat version of the witness protection program? Like they weren't trying to protect it from the elements, rather from criminals because the boat had testified against the mafia? Buck told people that he had won the vessel in a chess game with a millionaire. This is surprising. It's hard to believe that Buck knew how to play chess, much less could win a game. In addition, why would a millionaire gamble his luxurious boat to win the Iola? That was more of a liability than a prize. The police found photographs that Buck had taken of Iola being towed by Seawin on the open seas. This did not fit with his story of Iola sinking inside the harbor. The hatch cover for Iola was found on the island. It's clear the couple planned to sink the vessel. The couple said they had found the dinghy from the sea wind on the beach. It was upside down. That same dinghy was on board sea wind when the couple was arrested. Now, I guess they could have dragged it from the beach or sailed it back to sea wind, but it just seems strange that they would take that dinghy. It seems to be evidence in the disappearance of the Grams, yet they just put it right on the sea wind and sail away. Even though Malcolm Graham's remains were never found, the aluminum box containing Eleanor's remains was from an abandoned Air Force rescue boat. The boat had four boxes on it originally. One of those boxes was missing. Eleanor was shot at Point Blake Range, and her bones were exposed to extreme heat. Her remains were then placed in a container, and it appears as though it was wired shut. Wire was found next to it, like the wire had broken, and that's why the container opened. This is not like a case where she died accidentally, like she fell off the boat or something. The couple never used the radio to call for help. This seems odd considering the grams were missing. When Buck and Stephanie arrived in Hawaii, they did not turn themselves into the authorities. Rather, they both ran away when the authorities approached them. Now moving to the exculpatory factors. No physical evidence tied Buck and Stephanie to the crime. There was no murder weapon. There were no witnesses. Malcolm's body was never found. Perhaps he did shoot Eleanor, and then he somehow found a way off of the island. The couple claimed that they repainted and renamed the sea wind because a swordfish attacked the vessel at sea and punctured the hull. Technically, a swordfish could do this, but why would the couple rename the boat? Was the boat afraid that the swordfish would find it again and finish the job? Going back to the boat protection program, maybe the swordfish was who the boat was afraid of, this whole time. When considering the evidence, do I think that Buck and Stephanie were guilty? In my opinion, they were both guilty of murder beyond a reasonable doubt. I think that Stephanie escaped justice in this case. This case does bring up an interesting scenario. What happens when at least one of two or more people must have committed a crime, but there is no clear evidence pointing to one party over the other as guilty? This reminds me of the Robert Wohn case I covered not long ago. There were four men in a row house in Washington, D.C., and one was murdered. The police could never establish who did it. There was no evidence of a break-in, 
so they assume that one, two, or three of the men were involved. None of the men were ever convicted. When looking at the case of the Grahams, one question a jury might ask themselves is what balance of inculpatory and exculpatory factors existed for Buck Walker that did not exist for Stephanie Stearns? What made him look more guilty than her? He had a criminal record, he was on the run from the law, and he lied about winning the boat in a chess game. One could argue that gender stereotypes play a role as well when answering this question. Buck Walker was dominant, he was in charge, he had a violent temper, and only he was physically capable of disposing the bodies. There is no way to reverse this case. I don't think that a jury would believe for even a second that Stephanie Stearns killed the Grams and Buck Walker was innocent, like she boarded Iola after killing the Grams and Buck was shocked when she told him that she did it. He was just a little angel and had nothing to do with it, and she was the one who drove the entire crime forward. Realistically, any jury would believe that either Buck was guilty and Stephanie was innocent, or they both were guilty. There is no scenario where only Stephanie could be guilty. Could it be possible that Stephanie had no idea what Buck was going to do? Yes, but here's why I think there is no reasonable doubt in this case. Stephanie Stearns helped Buck Walker steal the boat. She had many opportunities to turn Buck in and didn't. She could have used a radio from either boat, and the two established that they worked together. They functioned as a couple. When somebody is cooperating with a murderer to a high degree, it makes them look like they were involved in the actual homicide. There are situations where this cooperation is so clear and extreme that it removes any reasonable doubt. It's difficult to believe that Stephanie Stearns was simply looking the other way after realizing Buck Walker committed two murders. I think it's more reasonable to believe that either Stephanie Stearns was a hostage or a perpetrator. She did not behave like a hostage in any way. The evidence points strongly to perpetrator. Now moving to my final thoughts. It appears that everybody who encountered Buck Walker knew he was dangerous. He may have used an alias, but it was a very thin disguise. He was reckless, impulsive, deceptive, and antisocial. Malcolm recognized that Buck Walker was bad news. He recognized that he was desperate for food and supplies. He recognized that he and his wife were alone with Buck Walker and his girlfriend on an otherwise deserted island. Despite this, Malcolm did not want to give in. He was on his last big ocean voyage and did not want anybody to take that from him. If he had listened to Eleanor or anyone else, they would have survived. Malcolm was holding on to his plans tightly. Buck Walker didn't really know how to make a plan. Malcolm Graham didn't know how to deviate from a plan. Those are my thoughts on the case of the Sea Wind murders. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis as intriguing as a government program designed to keep boat witnesses safe from swordfish perpetrators. Thanks for watching.